If you were here last week, you know that we studied in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 and 4, and the topic of that sermon was prayer. And if you recall, in the course of the sermon, I mentioned that prayer is one of those things that if you start talking about it, as believers, we feel guilty because we know we don't do enough of it. So if someone explains to you what the scriptures say about prayer and you read through it yourself, you realize, I'm not doing enough of that. Our topic this morning has similarities in that way to prayer, meaning as soon as we raise the topic, as soon as it's talked about, most of us come to the same conclusion and we think, I'm not doing enough of that. And the issue that we're going to be studying is the issue of evangelism, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world sharing the good news of what Jesus has done for us and sharing it with unbelievers who desperately need the gospel. In one sense, it sounds very, very simple. If you encounter an unbeliever, you just tell them about Jesus. You explain to them that all humans, including them, including you, are sinners, that God is holy, there is no unrighteousness in him, the wages of sin is death, we deserve death. Everyone will stand before the God of the universe at some point at the day of judgment. And there's nothing we can do to work off the guilt of our sins. We can do as many good deeds as we think, and they can't overcome even one sin, and we're all sinners. And you tell them that God showed mercy to mankind created in his image because God chose to send his son Jesus who lived the perfect life that we can't live, and he died on the cross in the place of sinners like us. The sin debt that we have, what we should endure as punishment for sin, he took in our place. And if you just repent and believe, you can have eternal life. Your sins are forgiven. Yet you know if you've been saved for any length of time that in practice, that's easier said than done. It's hard to do. Sometimes it's because we don't even have as much time as it took for me just then to share the truths of the gospel. We don't have that much interaction. The interaction's brief. Other times, we just don't want to be embarrassed and rejected. If we're honest, we're more like Peter, who denied Jesus three times, even though we know better. Sometimes it's because we're afraid we don't know the right words. We hear someone who's so eloquent sharing and we think, oh, I don't have all the right words and I don't know the right order. And so we're intimidated into silence. Sometimes perhaps we're just oblivious. We're not thinking about the gospel. We're not thinking about the lost. We're just living lives and we're consumed with whatever the task we have at hand. And sometimes it's because we wrongly think, well, evangelism is important, but that's the job of the evangelists or the missionaries or the pastors, not just the regular people like me. The reasons are endless. But if you ask most Christians, do you daily share the truth and reality of the gospel with unbelievers? Most Christians will say, no, no, I don't. So today I hope to challenge you. I don't want you to feel bad for the sake of feeling bad. I want you to do better. I hope that as we cover Colossians chapter 4 verses 5 and 6, that the task will become easier for you. My goal for you and me is to take serious the privilege and responsibility of evangelism. But I do want to warn you, you need to pay close attention to what is being said and honestly evaluate yourself. Because part of what I hope to show you from the Word of God is that whether you realize it or not, you're already witnessing more than you think you are. I think if I slightly rephrase my question, you'll see what I mean, because I'm going to rephrase it, but it's the same question that I just asked. It's just different wording. So here's the question. Are you communicating to unbelievers every time they see you or interact with you how, how much the gospel has impacted your life and how much you love Jesus? And whether you know it or not, if you're a believer, every single person who hears my voice, the answer to that question is yes. Every single time you interact with an unbeliever, you are showing them how much the gospel has impacted your life and how much you love Jesus. 
what I hope you'll understand after we go through our text today is that the issue is not whether you're communicating or sharing or witnessing. I assure you, you are doing that. The issue is whether what you're is whether what you are communicating is it positive or is it negative in relation to the gospel. Again, we'll see all this this morning. You can go ahead and turn in your Bibles if you haven't already done so to Colossians chapter 4. We're only going to be covering two verses, verses 5 and 6. But in reality, this is the end of Paul's teaching. There are further verses where he gives closing greetings and things. But in terms of his teaching to the people, this is what God expects of you. Verses 5 and 6 really largely bring that to an end. And in many respects, what he's doing is closing the loop and he's revisiting issues that he talked about in chapter 1 and he's closing the loop with his last words and finishing the thought. And this is really a fitting in for what he's taught these new believers in the church of Colossae. He's grounded them in the truths of the gospel. He's encouraged them for what they're doing well, but he's exhorted them to keep pressing on. He's praying for them. He's explained to them the reality of who Jesus is and what he's done in the face of false teachers who were proclaiming a different Jesus. He's proclaimed truth. He's warned them about error, and he's giving them very detailed and practical instruction on what God expects of them on a daily basis in terms of how they think, how they act, how they interact with other believers. And so in our two verses, he really gives a succinct summary of much of what he's already taught. But the context and substance make clear that he's explaining the importance of all that he said in terms of that issue of evangelism. Because the unbelieving world is always watching and listening whether we realize it or not. They need to see and hear about Jesus and not just from pastors or missionaries or evangelists. They need to see and hear about Jesus from you in your life and in your words. So I've, got, I've broken this down. There's two verses. The outline naturally flows from those two verses. But I'm going to read verses 5 and 6 of Colossians chapter 4, and then we'll go over the outline and we'll begin. Colossians 4 verse 5. Conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Whether it jumps out at you or not, really this is telling us about evangelism. And so my outline is following those lines. It's two universal principles of evangelism. Two universal principles of evangelism. And the first principle is this. Your daily life speaks volumes to unbelievers. Your daily life speaks volumes to unbelievers. Paul says this in verse 5 again. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. Making the most of the opportunity. He's summarizing the requirements in simple terms that are imposed upon all believers as we interact with this lost and dying world. He expects our lives to be evangelistic, as I hope we'll see as we go through this. But we need to walk through in greater detail what he says succinctly and simply. He begins with, conduct yourselves with wisdom. Conduct yourselves with wisdom is directed to everyone. Yourselves is all the church. All of us are required to do this. We're supposed to conduct ourselves in wisdom. And I believe in this context, the ESV translates it closer to the original. It says, walk in wisdom. Walk is simply an expression that the Bible often uses not to refer just to the literal act of walking, but it's talking about our life, how we live, how we treat those around us, how we do our jobs, how we play sports, how we eat, how we worship, how we do anything. And the Bible over and over refers to our lives as walking. Deuteronomy 11.22, for if you're careful to keep all this commandment which I'm commanding you to do, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and hold fast to him. 1 Kings 6, 11 and 12. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, 
concerning this house which you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and execute my ordinances and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will carry out my word with you which I spoke to David your father. Ephesians 5, 15, the very first part of the verse, therefore be careful how you walk. Conduct yourselves, walk in is really just talking about everything from the time your eyes open in the morning until you fall asleep at night. Everything in between is our walk. It's where we're supposed to conduct ourselves in wisdom. And wisdom isn't something that has to do with advanced degrees or college education. It has to do with the practical application of scripture on a daily basis, moment by moment. Wisdom is simply walking in obedience to the Lord's commands. Every day we're faced with countless choices. Do we do this? Do we do that? The choices may be in the workplace. It may be in some other relationship. But those choices are supposed to be influenced by the word of God. Wisdom is about making the best choices when we're faced with all of those difficult decisions. And this goes far beyond any notion of common sense. This is tied directly to God and his character and his word. Job 28, 28 says this, And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Psalm 111, verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments, his praise endures forever. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So in other words, the wisdom that we're supposed to walk in, that we're supposed to conduct ourselves daily in, what's supposed to guide our decisions is tied to the character of God, not just how much we know or how smart we are. It comes from knowing God and his word. Over and over, the scriptures make clear the central component of wisdom in the life of God's people. Proverbs 2, 6 to 10. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice, every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. To live with wisdom, one has to know the word of God. We have to daily be immersed in the scriptures, not just walking around reading it, but having internalized it so that when we're faced with those decisions, we can apply biblical principles as we navigate this difficult world. The reality is we cannot walk in a manner worthy of the Lord apart from our relationship to God and our relationship to his word. This world is not getting easier. You know that. It's increasingly hostile to what we do. Uh, Living by our values increasingly brings greater consequences. But let me encourage you, no matter how difficult the world gets, you can conduct yourselves with wisdom because God's already given you all that you need. 2 Peter 1, 2 and 3 has a profound promise about the provision that God has given to you as his child. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And we have the promise of the sufficiency of his word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, very familiar to many of us. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. In other words, in this difficult world, with all the decisions in front of you, God's already given you everything you need to navigate it wisely. But we have to avail ourselves of the resources God has given us. As you face decisions, large and small, as you do your job, as you decide how to spend money, as you make decisions for your family, the Word of God provides all you need to make those choices. And God understands that we're weak. 
And at times, even though he's already given us everything, we're still lost. We're still not sure what to do. And he says at those moments, you have access to the sovereign God of the universe. And he says, why don't you ask me and I'll help you. James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man not, ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-binded man, unstable in all his ways. In other words, God says, if you want to know how to walk wisely, ask me. But also believe in my provision for you. Believe that I'm a good God who will help you. And believe in the promise of my word if I direct you towards those promises in answer to the prayer. And really, everything we've covered up to this point in the first part of the verse is just basic Christianity. This is how we live the Christian life. And it's good and important that we go over the basics over and over again, even though we're in a solid church where this is taught repeatedly. In this regard, I'm simply echoing the Apostle Peter, 2 Peter 1.12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. In fact, Paul's already addressed aspects of this to the Colossians in chapter 3, for example, in verse 12, 13. He's telling them, how do you walk wisely with other believers? He says this, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgive, and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So there's a sense where Paul's already gone over the basics of Christianity in terms of how we operate within the household of God. But here, he's taking it a step further. And he's extending these duties beyond the walls of the church, beyond the confines of the Christian community. He's telling us we need to live out these basic principles of Christianity in a lost and dying world filled with unbelievers. And that's how he puts this particular aspect in context that he's talking about something that is evangelistic because he said, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Outsiders simply means those outside of the family of God. We live in a very inclusive society. Nobody wants to be left out. But Christianity is an exclusive faith. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There are those who are inside, who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and there are those on the outside. Don't take my word for it. Jesus said it. Mark 4, 11, And he was saying to them, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. Paul made this distinction in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 12 and 13. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. So what Paul is telling us in this simple verse, Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, is that we have to realize our behavior and conduct, especially toward outsiders, matters. I think Paul is teaching in different words, in a shorter way, what Jesus himself taught in Matthew 5, 14 and 16 about our opportunity to impact the lost. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. In other words, how we live reflects the gospel. Peter taught something similar, which he no doubt learned at the feet of Jesus. In 1 Peter 2.12, Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so in the thing, that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. 
And again, Paul taught something similar to the church in Philippi. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. Our verses this morning are teaching the exact same thing. Certainly we live obediently because God's watching. He is always there. And certainly we're supposed to act a certain way towards other believers. In fact, that's evangelistic. Jesus said, by this all men you'll know By this, all men will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. So that's important. Don't misunderstand. But what they're also teaching is that our lives, just in how we live them, reflect the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world. We do live in a crooked and perverse generation. It was that way 2,000 years ago. It's that way today. And yet we still have the ability to appear lights as lights in this dark world for Jesus. The world is a mess. Outsiders don't understand our worldview. They don't share our worldview. In fact, they're so hostile to it that they accuse us of all kinds of evil things, of hatred and all kinds of phobic uh, behavior because we don't go along with their immorality. But despite that, they are watching us. They see how you treat your family if they interact with you. They see how you do your job. They see how you act in the grocery store. They see how you act with the car mechanic. They see how you act everywhere. And they see how you react when things don't go your way. I read a great quote in the commentary series by William Hendrickson on this very point. He says this, It was then as it is now. In the long run, the reputation of the gospel depends on the conduct of its devotees. It is as if the apostle was saying, behave wisely toward outsiders, always bearing in mind that though few men read the sacred scrolls, all men read you. We have to realize this is happening every day whether we realize it or not. We are witnessing with our lives whether the gospel, gospel is truly our source of living. And Paul makes clear that we're supposed to have a sense of urgency and purposefulness about every single day. He says, conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. All he's saying is that every day, God is giving you opportunities to impact unbelievers. What are you doing with them? Make the most of them. He's using commercial language that has to do with buy up the opportunities. We are at a big grilling and barbecue weekend. But imagine you're at the store and there's a high quality prime steak, perhaps filet mignon, something that's very expensive. And you look and the case is full of it and the price is a dollar per pound. It's unheard of. And you look, and you can't believe your eyes, and it's not rotten meat. It's real, and it's good, and there's a lot of it. You don't look through and grab the best one. You grab them all and put them in your cart as quickly as you can. You want to maximize that deal. You want to take advantage of it. That's actually the imagery that the Apostle Paul is using That we have daily these opportunities and we should be so excited to be the opportunity to live for Christ that as we interact with unbelievers, we're purposeful. We're making the most of those opportunities by our conduct, by our actions. It's easy to forget, but as you get older like I am, it becomes more relevant But we have a finite number of days on this earth and what we do with them matters and we need to be careful. We need to have the heart of the psalmist in Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Again, these are dark times. And we have to stand out. We have to be different. 
Our lives are supposed to show the world that there's been a change from the inside on us. We have to live purposefully amongst outsiders, not carelessly or frivolously. Romans 13, 11 to 14, Paul there conveys something of the urgency given the hour in which we live. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lusts. Again, all of those things, all of these verses are describing what walking in wisdom looks like. And we're doing it towards outsiders and we're taking every advantage. We're making the most of every opportunity because we never know when our example might strike something in someone's heart such that they turn to hear the gospel. I read it before, but 1 Peter 2.12 makes it clear. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Again, talking about unbelievers. So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers... They may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. In other words, some people who now are accusing us of all kinds of evil, who calls us this phobic and that phobic, and say we're filled with hate. Some of those people are watching us. And if we're living gracious and kind lives, walking in wisdom, obeying the scriptures, at least some of them may soften and eventually upon hearing the gospel say, I want what I saw in them. And we have to care about unbelievers. We have to care about the lost. Proverbs 11.30 said, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he who is wise wins souls. So can I plead with you this morning? Think carefully about how you live, particularly amongst unbelievers. Think about what your life and how you act is saying about the gospel. Over the years, in the 30 years I've been a believer, Debbie and I have been a part of four different churches, and I've met Christians who are so kind, and they're so gracious, and they're so thoughtful of others, and they're so helpful, and they're so selfless, that I thought, wow, I, I want to be like them. Because they were walking in wisdom. But I've also met countless Christians who live terrible lives. They're rude to others. They're mean and angry. They're selfish. They're looking out only for their own interest. Those who haven't taken to heart Paul's warning in Colossians 3, 8, and 9. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Again, I've been around people in various environments, and I'm sure you have too, where I've known them long enough, I've seen how they live. And then I hear them say sometime, oh, I'm a Christian too. And I think, what? There's no way. When people say that about you? Let me exhort you. Examine yourselves. Look in the mirror. Honestly evaluate how you live. And if we had the opportunity to interview the unbelievers that you interact with, will they see a difference in your life? Let me encourage you. Read Galatians 5. There's an account there of the deeds of the flesh, and there's also the familiar list of the fruits of the Spirit. What does your regular daily life look like? Not just here on Sunday mornings, but during the day as you go about your life. Do unbelievers see your light shine for Christ? Or do they see another person just going through the motions, angling for advantage, looking out for number one? In other words, another person where they would say, well, they're just like me. Let 
we live in difficult times and my heart's been concerned for many years about the tone of evangelicalism in America. I'm not speaking at you. I have to confess the issues of my own heart. But as I look around and I interact and I see what Christians are writing and saying and I'm looking at what's going on, it seems like we're gearing up for a political and social war with unbelievers. As though we're tired of being pushed around by them and their agenda, which is immoral and wrong, such that they're pushing and they're loud and rude and we're going to be loud and rude right back so we can stop what they're doing. They're going to learn they can't push us around. Let me encourage you, be careful. You know, will not win the loss that way. And if we decide we're going to play by their rules, we're sinning against our God. Romans 12, 17 to 18 says this, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Walking in wisdom isn't preparing to scream and holler and fight this evil culture. It's walking in obedience to the word with the hope that God will change their heart. Let me encourage you, if you're tempted to take up the weapons of the modern culture to put those evil unbelievers in their place, let me encourage you, put down those weapons. We're engaged in spiritual warfare, but remember, our struggle's not against flesh and blood. We're not to be at war with our society and unbelievers. We're supposed to be trying to reach them for the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the only hope for true change. We're to be seeking their salvation through our righteous lives by conducting ourselves in wisdom towards them. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 4 summarizes it well. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgivings be made on behalf of all men for kings and all who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So let me encourage you to take a deep breath as part of your self-examination. The days are evil, yes. But we don't combat their evil by becoming like them. We're different. Our lives can be a light penetrating in these dark days if we walk in wisdom towards outsiders. Paul's words to the Ephesians summarize this well. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So our first universal principle of evangelism is that your daily life speaks volumes to unbelievers. The second principle is this. Every word you utter impacts your gospel witness. Every word you utter impacts your gospel witness. We see this in verse 6. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. They say at times actions speak louder than words, and that's true, and that's an emphasis of verse 5, but points, verse 6 is making clear what you say does have an impact as well. We may need to make sure that our words are honoring to the Lord. And Paul shows us how. Let your speech always be with grace. This is something that is for all of us, and it's supposed to be something that we always do. Not some words, but all of our words. Every word that comes out of our mouth is to be gracious. It's to be kind and merciful. And as believers, if we think about it, it makes sense because we've been shown God's grace. His unmerited favor, His mercy towards sinners. We didn't deserve it from the Lord, but He chose to save us. 
He drew us to himself and showed us mercy and grace. And our speech should reflect that reality always. And particular emphasis here is the context towards outsiders, towards unbelievers. We should overflow with kindness in our words to others no matter what the circumstances are. God's grace knows no limits and it should be reflected always in our speech. Our speech should be pleasant such that others would want to hear what we say. And we have to always remember, we do have the ability to do this. It's hard, but God has given us a new heart. And our words are simply a reflection of what's on the inside. And that can be comforting, but also challenging if we're not careful. Jesus made clear that our hearts are what drive what comes out of our mouth. Matthew 12, 34 to 36. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. God has transformed us. He's given us new hearts. Our hearts have been regenerated, and our speech should reflect this truth. I know there are people who are quiet, and they seldom talk in a group setting. They're content to sit quietly. Unfortunately, that's not who I am. I talk all the time. And I knew from my earliest days of salvation, as I started reading the scriptures, that that was going to be a problem for me. I would love it if I didn't talk so much because I read and understand what the scriptures say. Proverbs 10, 19, where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. But he who restrains his lips is wise. We have to be careful and think about what we're communicating to a lost and dying world, regardless of the conversation. Be it about holy things in the scriptures or be it about mundane things in the workplace. We've got to think carefully. Jesus' warning about careless words is echoed elsewhere. Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. James 1, 19, the beginning of the verse. This you know, my beloved brethren, but every mo everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak. In other words, the more reflection we take before words come out of our mouth, the more likely that they will have grace. Because if we're not careful, we can do a lot of damage with our words. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one who speaks rashly like the thrusts of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 16, 27, and 28, A worthless man digs up evil while his words are like scorching fire. A perverse man spreads strife, and a slanderer separates intimate friends. These are graphic depictions in Scripture of the damage that you can do if you don't control your words. And we realize the reality of this in everyday life apart from Scripture. How many conflicts are caused by talking? People are offended. People said something and it was misunderstood. People said something intentionally hurtful. Probably every one of us has had a time where we said something and no sooner had the words left our mouth that we said, uh-oh, I shouldn't have said that. And you can't take it back. And in our day and age, there's a lot of posts on social media that are that way. They're deleted, but they pop back up. This is a struggle for us, but we have to take it seriously. As God's children, we are to speak kind and gracious words. But James describes the struggle we have. James 3, 8 to 10. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. It happens to us. We're here on Sunday and we're on our good behavior. We're singing songs and we're talking and we're smiling. And then we go to the office and things happen and suddenly we're a different person. That shouldn't be. 
or perhaps we're interacting with the lost and we're talking about politics or leadership or something like that and immediately instead of remembering we're cursing men when we should be praying for them be careful Paul describes further what he's saying let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt I read two lines of thinking on this phrase seasoned with salt and I don't think they're necessarily either or they're both and Salt, in ancient times in particular, was often used as a preservative. It still is in some instances. But the idea is it keeps things from going bad. It keeps things from spoiling. It preserves them. And our speech can have that impact when we're speaking according to the Spirit. Our words can be gracious and kind, and they can help preserve an atmosphere. They can keep something from going into an evil. We can steer conversations away from the wrong things. We can stop inappropriate humor before the punchline. We can do things and not take the bait when it comes to responding to a rude or crass innuendo. So salt's a preservative, but also it adds flavor. It's a seasoning that makes bland things more pleasant and enjoyable, and our words, rightly chosen, can do the same thing. They can have a positive impact in a conversation, making things uplifting and encouraging rather than dark and despairing. And Paul makes it clear as he's telling us to speak this way that there's an evangelistic component. He says, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. The implication from the context is that in interacting with unbelievers, we have opportunities in various ways to impact them. And if we're careful with our speech, then we're more mindful that each person needs to be addressed as an individual and in their own needs. And we'll be more guarded in how we respond, whether it's just with words of kindness or whether the door is open for us to share the gospel. God gives us opportunities that we should buy up for our actions, but he also gives us those same opportunities with our words, and we have to be ready to respond appropriately. And you never know when God might give you the opportunity to share the gospel. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. In other words, with speech that is gracious, seasoned with salt. This applies to everything. It applies to the auto mechanic that you're talking with. It applies to the grocery store clerk. It requires, it applies to the co-worker. It applies to your family members. Our words are a reflection of our hearts and character, and we need to make sure that we're reflecting Jesus, not our sinful tendencies. So again, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's do an honest examination. Just think about all the unbelievers that you interact with, be it for a few moments or regularly, and what would they say about the words that come out of your mouth? Are you quick to criticize and complain about what's going on around you? Philippians 2.14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Do you laugh at and participate in locker room type talk or inappropriate humor Ephesians 5, beginning of verse 4, and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting. Do you stretch the truth or tell little white lies to get ahead in business or to take advantage? Proverbs 12, 22, the beginning of the verse, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Do you gossip and spread stories about others? without even thinking about whether they're true. You just heard it, so you want everybody else to know it. Do you say mean and hurtful things to make others look bad because you're angry with them and you want them to suffer? Colossians 3, 8, 9. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. If people insult you or they offend you or they attack you verbally, do you get right back in their face and let them know they can't push you around? 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23, for you have been called for this purpose 
Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. You spend time criticizing those in authority over you and talking about how evil and terrible and foolish they are. Titus 3, 1 to 2, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. I think you get the point of the scriptures. And I could go to countless other areas and find countless other scriptures This is critical for us to realize the impact of our words because they can destroy our ability to share the gospel of Jesus Christ if we're not careful. I get it. Nobody's more frustrated with this world than I am. I'm right there with you. It is infuriating. In a matter of 10 to 20 years, things have spiraled even further out of control. Up is down, good is evil, evil is virtue. I have the same struggle in my heart when I see advertisements and all kinds of foolishness and news articles. But we have to realize that we have to be careful how we respond to this world because we're supposed to be a light drawing them to the gospel. And if we're not careful, how we speak can destroy our testimony. Why would people listen to us share the gospel if what they normally hear from our lips are harsh and angry words attacking? Let me encourage you. This is hard. But there's hope. God didn't leave us alone. Not only has he given us his word, but he's given us his spirit to help us, to remind us of the truths that we need to reflect upon before we open our mouths. John 14, 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So again, let's slow down. We have to have those scriptures bubbling up in our hearts. But we have to want to get control of our tongues. How do we do it? How do we make certain our speech is gracious, seasoned with salt? How do we make sure that we have the right words for the right answer at the right time? First, let me encourage you. If God has convicted you that this is a problem for you, you need to pray to him. He will help you. Psalm 141 verse 3 was a part of our scripture reading. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. If you recognize this morning you need that, pray that to God. Again, if you wonder, well, how do I speak correctly? How do I do this? Pray to God, James 1, 5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, and that would include wisdom and how to speak, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. It means that God doesn't slap you on the hand and say, why are you asking me? I've already told you. He says, come, I'll help you. Second, let me encourage you, be honest with your struggle. Don't justify your harsh words. Don't justify your wicked words. Analyze it in relation to Scripture. If you have a problem with gossip, go to the Scriptures that deal with this. If you have a problem with angry words, go to the Scriptures that deal with this. If you have a problem with dishonesty, go to the Scriptures that deal with these things. There are Scriptures that deal with talking and speech everywhere. Memorize them, internalize them. For years, when I worked in a secular environment, I carried a three by five card in my pocket that I had handwritten out verses, most of which had to do with how I spoke. And I would read it before meetings. I would read it as I was walking to meetings. I was reading, sitting at my desk, reminding myself, because that's the only way to internalize gracious speech is to see what it is as reflected by the word of God. 
one of the scriptures that I use often in my own heart, even now is a great summary of what Paul is saying. Let no unwholesome, Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so it will give grace to those who hear. I pray that you have the heart of God when it comes to the outsiders, the unbelievers that you interact with. I know that can be frustrating and annoying, but so can Christians. We need to care about their souls. We need to care about whether they come to faith. Realize this, you're witnessing every day. You're an evangelist every day, whether you know it or not. With everything you do, with every word you say, you're reflecting something about the gospel. I pray that you'll live carefully so that it reflects the love and grace of Jesus Christ. I pray that God will work in you to help you. I'll close with Colossians 3, 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, it's so easy in the busyness of life to lose sight of the fact that we are daily stating something about our faith through how we live and how we speak. Lord, far too many of us, and it includes me as well, have been careless with our actions and careless with our words. Lord, forgive us. Lord, our society tests us. The things that are going on bother us, and they should because they're unrighteous. But Lord, help us respond to unrighteousness in a godly way. Lord, I pray that you'll help each believer here seize the opportunities through conduct and through words to be a winsome witness for the gospel. Lord, may everyone we interact with, but especially unbelievers, see in us the love of Jesus Christ, the kindness and grace and mercy that you've shown us help us show to others through both word and deed. And Lord, even as we're living amongst some believers and they're all around us, it could be that some who are hearing my voice don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that today would be the day that you'd open their eyes and they'd recognize that they are sinners before a holy God, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Lord, I I pray, Lord, that you would help them understand that one day everyone will stand before the judgment seat. Lord, I help them to understand that the only hope they have before a holy God is Jesus Christ. Lord, they deserve punishment for their sin. Help them realize that Jesus died in the place of sinners and that if they'll place their faith in him and turn from their sin, they will have forgiveness and everlasting life. Lord, we pray that as we leave this place, we will impact our community. Lord, help our impact be positive and not negative. Help us live in word and deed for your glory. And we pray this In the name of our Savior, Jesus, amen. Thank you.